Because you need to trust your editor that they know your story and the core of what you want to speak to with your readers and that they're going to help you tell that story. Well, we, we seem to have lots in common and our personality was we were attracted to each other's energy. Mm -hmm. But we were also both deeply dissatisfied with our corporate careers. <laughs> and we're both like, how do we escape this? So I think at one point we're like, how about you become a freelance editor and you become a full-time writer and we'll just help each other. And that's exactly what we did. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 217 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. This is an extra episode. In between the Friday broadcasts, I'm bringing you an extra interview with Sarah Cades and Adrian Kerr, a dynamic author and editor combination. Not only are they really close friends, but they have an amazing writer-editor working relationship, and they had so many inspiring inspiring things to share about writing, about editing, about collaborating and working together that I knew it would be valuable for you listeners. Now, this was done during a live chat I did with them. I did that to my YouTube channel. There'll be a link to that in the show notes, but this is a slightly abbreviated version. Some of the tech issues we had have been cut out as well as the intro and outro music that was used uh, because that was a video and you can see it on the YouTube channel. But uh, this will be a uh, an episode with a less of the introductory stuff from me because I want to get right into the interview. We're just going to hear a word from this episode sponsor and then cut right over to the interview with Sarah and Adrian. This episode is sponsored by my own brand, Stark Publishing and Stark Publishing Solutions. I have six books in the Stark Publishing Solutions series. Now I have the seven P's of publishing success, killing it on Kobo, an author's guide to working with bookstores and libraries, wide for the win, and publishing pitfalls for authors. And I said six, didn't I? Man, I should get my own ad reads right. Five books in the Stark Publishing Solutions series, and I'm not going to redo that because you're just going to hear it just as is because why not? Good to, good to hear me goof up once in a while, right? We're all human. Now those books are available on all the wide publishing platforms, as are a couple of other books that I have for writers. Uh, I co-authored a book with Maddie Dalrymple called Taking the Short Tack, which is strategies for using short fiction as an author for marketing and engaging with your readers, and also co-authored The Relaxed Author with Joanna Penn. Now that last one with Joanna Penn, The Relaxed Author, is available in a story bundle, uh, part of uh, Kevin J. Anderson's wonderful NaNoWriMo story bundle. And that is a bundle that features such amazing books. Now, the great thing about this bundle with Story Bundle is there's over 15 uh, books plus access to software from so many amazing writers. Whether you're looking for the craft of writing, whether you're looking for the business of writing, you've got books from Sasha Black on creating side characters. You've got uh, M.L. Ron's uh, Be a Writing Machine. You've got the 30-Day NaNoWriMo Prep Workbook by C. Michelle Jeffries. Furry fiction is everywhere. You've got killer content by Andrea Pearson. You've got Shut Up and Write. You've got Slush Pile Memories from Kevin J. Anderson. Release Strategies from Craig Martell. The Survival Kit for Writing Write by Patricia McLynn. The Coffee Break Novelist by Kevin McLaughlin. The Indie Author's Bible by Christopher Schmidt. Self-Publishing for Authors by C.A. Price. Oh my God, Monica Leonel. Novel Writing Prep. Of course, I mentioned the relaxed author uh, and more. I just, uh, I, I, that's that's just how great this bundle is. Pay what you want, get access to these 15 books, plus access to some great software for writers, 
and that's going to be available only until the end of November 2021, and you can find that over at storybundle.com. Uh, obviously, if you're listening to this way after that, there'll probably be a couple other uh, different um, um, great bundles available for you, but this one's specifically for writers, and it's part of Kevin J. Anderson's annual uh, NaNoWriMo writing bundle. And I'm honored to be a part of that. And you can check that out. There'll be a link to that over in the show notes at starkreflections.ca, as well, of course, links to all of my other books for writers. Well, like I said, this is going to be brief introductory uh, patter, pitter-patter, matter, babble, chatter, chatter, chatter. That was the word I was looking for. I should use a thesaurus or something when I'm standing up here. Anyways, that's it for the introductory chatter. Let's get right into this fascinating conversation with Sarah and Adrian. Welcome. This is uh, Mark Leslie LeFay from the Stark Reflections podcast, and I am honored to have in the virtual studio tonight with me, Sarah Cadiz and Adrian Kerr. Hey guys, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thanks we, for that intro. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an awesome book, and I'm just excited. Uh, actually, you know what? Uh, we're going to talk about the book a little bit, so we're going to tease this out. I want to actually go back and find out a little bit about how you guys ended up meeting, your backgrounds as writers, as editors, as publishing people. So, Sarah, I want to start with you. Is when did you first know that you wanted to be a writer? Actually, I was pretty late to the game. I've always been a voracious reader. Um, like I, as a kid, I read all the um, books in, in the library in like the kids section. And then we moved town. So I was so grateful because I had a whole new library to read. Um, but I had never considered writing. That was what other people did, right? Um, and then I, I worked at a really awesome bookstore in Winnipeg. And one of my colleagues suggested I, I try writing um, for an anthology. And I thought she was nuts. But, but then I thought that might be fun. So I gave it a try. And that novella was accepted. Um, yeah, and I, I realized how much I loved writing, and then I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about it, and that was back in 2009. So, okay. relatively, you know, new to the game. That might sound weird to people because we're in 2021, but writing careers span decades. So, does yeah. it feel like yesterday? Sometimes it does, and other times it it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on it depends on the day. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Adrian, who uh, was the editor uh, of, of Kiss Me in the Rain, the novel, mm -hmm. uh, I know from a past life in our book selling uh, history. <laughs> but um, how did you get into editing? Because when I met you, yeah. you were a publishing sales rep for a major Canadian publisher. Yeah, I was a sales rep for three years. And uh, my territory was southwestern Ontario. My job was to travel around to all of the bookstore accounts in my territory and, uh, and sell the list, the list of new titles, to booksellers. And you <laughs> were at one of those university bookstores. You were handling all the book events and um, scheduling kind of big reading series, I think. Anyway, um, yeah, so I was, I was really happy living my dream as a publisher sales rep traveling around talking about books all day and um as a part of that job because i spent so little time in the office i had to communicate with my colleagues through reports and i would write this weekly report called notes from the field and in it <laughs> i had to talk about the books that i was selling into the territory you know what i would read on the publisher's list that I really thought was great and how I was selling it in. So I was writing very positively, quite extensively about the books on the publisher's list. And I didn't realize it at the time, but some of the editors would take out those little excerpts and they would send them to the authors and the agents. And I would get really <laughs> great feedback. And so like three years in, I get this call from the executive publisher saying, we have an opening for a commercial fiction editor, and do you want the job? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> that was like a dream come true. Of course, I had to say yes. I was absolutely terrified. It was the kind of thing that I'd actually never let myself dream for myself. You know, like I knew wow. there was so much competition to be an editor. And I didn't, I mean, I'd, I'd worked in books for like 12 years at that point, but it had always been 
retail and sales and the business side of it. But anyway, this opportunity dropped in my lap and I just had to take it. So I said yes and I had to give up my company car and my, you know, cushy work from home gig <laughs> and go into the office, took a pay cut. Uh, but it was just too amazing to turn down. So um, I, I, I was uh, uh, an editor at that company for nine years. And, uh, and then I, I, I went freelance. I started to uh, run my own business. But that's how I got into editorial, first of all. It was, it was just a crazy, a crazy thing that happened. And, Interesting um, that your, your passion showed in your other role for the writing and the creativity yeah, that led to yeah. another job. That is amazing. I think it started because, um, you know, when you're a bookseller, and I know you've, you've both done that, actually. Yeah. You have to hand sell, right? You have to figure out, you know, what someone's taste is really quickly and then, you know, figure out how to position this book so that, you know, they want to buy it. You have to be enthusiastic. You have to be authentic, most of all. And once I had that down, like it was, it's always been easy for me to talk about books on any other topic. I'm a bumbling fool, but books, <laughs> I can just go. I hear you. <laughs> so it was, it was just the most natural thing in the world. And, and, and those skills all kind of bleed together. If you can speak intelligently and sincerely about what moves you in a book, you're, <laughs> you know, you're halfway there. So that was, that was how it all happened. Awesome. You know, can I ask, cause I'm going to ask Sarah the similar question is, mm -hmm. do you remember the first book that you got to edit for this publisher? Oh yes. Oh yeah. So this is a book that um, I did not acquire. It had been acquired before I joined the, 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 before I had the position. So my predecessor had acquired it and she left. And then it was my job to bring it to market. So I, you know, I read it right away. I know exactly what I love about it. I know exactly how to get it to the to the to the to the to the quality to the condition that I needed to have to get to market. So you know, I write my editorial letter. I send it to my boss, you know, just for the double check. And she's like, "Yeah, yeah, send this off." So I sent it off, and and the author and I went back and forth on some structural issues, on some line editing issues, and then we we published it. We you know got a cover for it and. There was a great marketing campaign because it had this, it had this, there was this feeling around it, like it could be something bigger than just the category that we were publishing it in. So the book comes out and it gets a not so hot review <laughs> in a national paper. And that was the point at which I realized, oh my God, the successes and failures in this job our national news. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I'm so, like, I was just heart heartbroken. But the next week, it was on the bestseller list. <laughs> so the first book I edited became, a, a, it wasn't a Globe and Mail, it was a Toronto Star national bestseller. And, and then it hit the Globe list, and then it hit the other list, and I was just like, oh my God, I can do this. <laughs> so it was an amazing first experience. Yeah, the national stage, the, the highs and the lows yeah. are all for, mm -hmm. there for everyone to see. So, Sarah, with your passion for writing, what, do you remember the the first story, the first book that you had published? What was that experience like? I you? do. And actually, I totally remember my editor because she was amazing, like amazing. Um, yeah, it was with a small uh, press out of the eastern U.S. Um, and my editor, she was amazing. I had never... Um, I'd never gone through this process before and uh, she was very gentle. So she wrote a really awesome email first and actually Adrian's awesome at that too. Basically outlining expectations, right? So she, she explained what she was doing. She explained strengths. She explained where I, what I needed to work on at the, at the time, my favorite authors head hopped. So I had hopped. I didn't stick with a single POV per um, per chapter or per scene or whatever. So there was a lot of a lot of different colors. There were so many corrections she used. Like she color coded it. There were so many things I needed to uh, address. Um, but I love the process. I think it's because she was such an amazing editor and such a actually kind, gentle soul who nurtured who nurtured me. Um, that's actually. I can definitely attribute me sticking with um, writing too, because it was such a positive experience. Um, 
yeah, she just, I learned so much. And then I, I realized how smart it is to listen to your editors. And I understand that not like, you have to have good chemistry with your editor. Like not, not all editors and authors will be a good fit, but man, she just, I'm to this day, I'm eternally grateful to Wendy Jo. Um, yeah. And so that's why, yeah, years later when I ended up working with Adrian, having that chemistry and, and cause you need to trust your editor that they know your story and the core of what you want to speak to with your readers and that they're going to help you tell that story. Yeah. So I had, I was so lucky and so, I'm so grateful that I had such a positive experience. It sounds, and, and you've already kind of said this, but it sounds like the, that relationship with your editor is a, a fundamental and critical relationship. Yeah. If you know what life, life is as fun and, quite frankly, frankly pleasure, as pleasurable as you make it. And to make my life as awesome as I want, I love surrounding myself with amazing, awesome people that I can learn from. And having a great editor that I really, really jam with. Yeah, actually, it's just, why why would you settle for anything out, you know, be, beyond that or, or outside of that sphere? So Cur curious to get to the superhero origin story of you guys. How did <laughs> you guys meet? Can I can I start, Adrian? Yeah. Okay. So, if you ever read the like how tos approaching editor acquiring editors for any publishing house, but especially like major publishing houses, they always say never corner anyone in the bathroom. Just just so you know, eyes wide open, never corner anyone in the bathroom. I was I can't remember if I was walking out or or walking into the washroom at when words collide in Calgary when Adrian when like in the foyer of the bathroom I saw her and I can't even remember what I told you but that was like the first time I talked to you I don't know if you remember that or not and one of my friends was like Sarah you don't do that and like she's cool like I had to tell her I think um, I think I just heard you present and gosh like you're so good at it and and the information you gave was so amazing um, yeah, so I don't know if you remember that, but I totally do. <laughs> I totally you know what? going into as that. You, as you describe it, it's kind of coming back to me now, and I was probably really grateful to get the kind feedback because when I do a presentation, I'm like an absolute bundle of nerves, and it's excruciating. So I would have been like really open to hearing some something nice. But what I remember, <laughs> this is the second time, my second, my return trip yep. to When Words Collide. And you were my lia my guest liaison. Yes. So yeah. I get off the flight <laughs> in Calgary and I go to arrivals. Kind of I'm I'm arriving and she's waiting for me. And she greets me with this gigantic sunflower smile. It's the one that you can see on your screen right now. And I'm like, who is this chick? She is so <laughs> loving and warm and wonderful. All I remember is <laughs> I don't know. I think I was going through some heavy duty, romantic, bad stuff. Yep. And I divulged my <laughs> deepest secrets to her between the airport and the hotel. And at that point, I'm just like, she knew absolutely <laughs> everything there was to know about me. Safely. Like, Safe yes, we're stuck with each other. <laughs> yep. When you've got that, but when you've got that friendship chemistry, like, yeah. Yeah, you got it. So we had it really early on. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. When you're divulging, by the time you got to the hotel, yeah. you were pretty much besties. But we <laughs> so, were besties. So, at, at, at what point did that become um, an addition? I know you guys are are, are good friends and you're solid yeah. connected. But at what I point was, did the the transaction start to take place? Well, I I was thinking about this earlier today, and I realized that not only did we have like well, we, we seem to have lots in common and our personalities, like we were attracted to each other's energy, mm -hmm. but we were also both deeply dissatisfied with our corporate careers. Yes. And we're both like, how do we escape this? How do we escape? Yeah. And um, I just remember <laughs> all kinds of conversations at work. How do I quit this job, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> she was doing the same. So I think at one point we're like, how about you become a freelance editor and you become a full-time writer and we'll just help each other. And that's exactly what we did. So she, was, she was my second 
freelance editorial clients. Really? Wow. And so she supported me and I'm like, I'm going to support her. So yeah. that was, um, that was it. And we, I don't know, like the books continue, the work continues, the friendship continues. It's just, yeah. yeah, we, we really help each other at a critical juncture in our kind of professional and creative lives. It was, yeah, yes. like gift from God is what I. <laughs> is Thank what you. I Thank you. That means yeah. a lot. Ditto. Yeah. That was a, that was a very charged time. And you know, you know how friendships forge, you know, like those strong, strong bonds forge in like those really yeah cataclysmic fires yeah. that you go through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, that's it. Well, that is a perfect segue. Speaking of tension and stress and romantic suspense, uh, that is a perfect segue into Kiss Me in the Rain, where a really close relationship mm -hmm. happens in a very stressful situation. Can you talk a little bit about the novel Kiss Me in the Rain? I can. Um, so this actually was, um, this is only the second um this is the first full length novel I've ever written. And like the second book, the first one was a novella. So this was the first full length. And they say, write what you know, right? And I I spent the last 20 years in the environmental services industry, including over half of that as an archeologist. And so, and a lot of that also up in uh, Northern Alberta in the, Alberta, the Athabasca oil sands. So I thought, I love it up there and it's so contentious. So I'm going to set a, a book there because, yeah, because I love that land. I love, um, I love who I am up there. It just, it's when I'm, I'm, when I'm in natural spaces, I just, I guess I just tune in more to me and that's writing this book. I wanted to share that with people. Um, yeah. So <laughs> sorry. I, 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 I went all over the place. So can you repeat the question, Mark? <laughs> it's okay. I want to understand the main conflict between the okay. two wonderful love interests in this novel. So, okay, thank you for bringing me, grounding me back. So, um, Savannah, um, her dad, so Savannah's an environmentalist and her family, um, her parents don't know that because um, they never really paid attention um, as she was growing up and in her university degrees and, and so on. Her dad's a, a big oil guy and that's his focus. So um, I don't know if you guys know this, but often there's contention, um, there's conflict and tension between environmentalists and those in the oil industry. Um, there doesn't have to be, but but there is. That's That's, especially in Alberta, that's kind of a, I'm even gonna call it a trope here. <laughs> That's a trope that you can count on. So I have a the dynamic, the friction within the family and she comes home for a wedding um, and she's, yeah, so she's she, she had moved to Toronto. That too is another thing. I don't know if those in Eastern Canada understand Western angst. I certainly didn't um, when I lived in Eastern Canada, but the further West I move, like the more I realized that culturally that's actually a, that's a thing. And that's really, sorry, I'm going to loop around. I'm going to tangent a bit. Um, I really love to include in my books, um, actually, so like social issues, social topics, um, themes that are um, sometimes hot button for people, because if you read it in a novel, you can be, become aware or exposed to ideas that you don't want to read in the newspaper because that those are usually pretty firm, angry opinions, right? But in but in a fiction novel, it's it's just a more for me a more organic way to to learn about social issues or or becoming more aware of things when you're not being beat over the head with it. You're just becoming aware of things. So I've got that dynamic. I also have Gabe, who he was um, a CSIS agent, and I don't know if if our, our viewers know what CSIS is, but that's Canada's um, uh, security intelligence uh, service. So he became a CSIS agent to pay for his um, university. And I don't know if anybody here had to pay for the university, but God, it's expensive. So um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm rambling because I'm nervous and also having a ton of fun. So I have, he be, he's an archeologist. He knows um, Savannah's dad. He's friends with Savannah's dad. They met in the hospital. Um, 
Yes. Again, when you have those those high state crisis moments, when you that's when you bond with people. Like that's yeah. Like we were just talking about, that's when you really bond with things. So we've got Gabe and Dallas who have bonded in the hospital. We've got Savannah who's not sure if she wants to bond with her dad. And then we've got Gabe and Savannah who are super crazy attracted to each other. So it's it's a triangle of emotions, but not a love triangle. Does that make sense? Can so make Gabe, sense. yeah, Gabe helped. Um, I'm also a big fan of using love and actually romantic relationships to bring out the best in people. Because when we feel good and feel confident in ourselves, we look at everything else more openly. And I feel with a with more perspective, a, a, a wider perspective. So that's why I love including love stories in my in my stories and in my novels. Because for me, it's just such a universal potent necessity in life, at least in my life. It's been. Can I ask, is is the setting a character in this novel? 100%. Oh my God, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, for me, the land is, um, the land is so important to me. And for a lot of people, anecdotally, I've, I've heard people use when, when discussing landscapes or, or land forms, or I'll be honest, most, most people aren't as nerdy as, as I am with, with the land and don't call it land forms, but there is a disconnect or even a divorcing, um, between ourselves and the natural world. And again, I love using I love using setting and the land as a character so that that readers fall in love with as much as I have because I love sharing that with readers because it's so important to me. A, a very quick snapshot of that brief example of that is my mom does not like flying in airplanes at all as we discussed before this went live um, flying in airplanes. Um, so she doesn't, and so she never sees the view from the air. And when I fly in an airplane, and so like from 40,000 feet, the view is incredible. Like you can see like the serpentine um, shapes of the rivers. You can see coolies like just so exquisitely. Um, I remember seeing the fjords flying over Greenland. Like it's just the view is so exquisite. So there's a scene in Kiss Me in the Rain where I actually was right. I wrote it thinking of my mom because I wanted her to be able to picture what it, that view because she doesn't see it because that's not her jam being that high but I know she'd appreciate the beauty of it so um, that's the that's how I like to include um, landscape and scene as characters um, yeah because I love it and I hope my readers have a chance to love it too awesome <laughs> I, I, I love the tie-in between the tension and the book and the bonding that happens and the bonding that happened between the two of you. Uh, so I want to get back to, so I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So Adrian, uh, you've edited books with a major publisher and now you're freelance editing. Is, is there a different approach? I mean, obviously acquisitions is going to be a different thing, but is yeah. there a different approach to how you work on uh, a book or how you, how many you can work on at a time, any of those things? It's, I think it's the same approach. It's the same process as it is inside a big house. And it's, uh, you know, you, you spend some time kind of building a rapport, building trust first, and then you whack them off at the knees <laughs> with your brutal comments. Um, <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's it's exactly the same process. It's, um, it, I, I find that um, my appetite for the kind of down and dirty work of editing gets satisfied more in my freelance career. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just because the the manuscripts that I saw when I was acquiring um, were just all of a very high quality and they were all, like some of them were pitch perfect and required virtually no editing to bring them to market. Now that it's always exciting to acquire a book like that because you know it, you just know it's going to be funny. But there's not very much work to do, so you find yourself in endless meetings and not really mm -hmm. kind of getting down into it. Now freelance, you see projects at all different stages, and um, I've used muscles in my freelance career that I didn't know I had. So in terms of you know my ongoing training. I mean, freelance is rigorous. 
Um, and it's amazing. It's amazing. And there's there's a whole, you know, there's a, a wide variety. When I was acquiring at the big house, <laughs> I make it sound like prison. <laughs> when I was acquiring at the big house, um, I had a very, I mean, I didn't have a really narrow area of acquisition, but I certainly wasn't allowed to step outside of it. That would be infringing on the territory of other editors. <laughs> in my in my freelance work if if someone comes to me and, and it's a project that you know i'm not i'm not feeling tremendously comfortable or confident with because it's a different genre or it's just something i've not had experience i'm up front about it and i'm like but let's give it a try what do you say so i find myself kind of branching out into different areas and um and that's that's a lovely thing too yeah. oh that's cool yeah i never thought about that if you're only acquiring for a particular yeah. imprint or line then obviously you have restrictions on what yes. you can work on Yes, wow. and it's good to have a specialty, but it's also great to break out of that every once yeah. in a while. And well, I start with a get a better view, a better view, exactly. Yeah. Get a yeah. better view. Yeah. And there's that view again from the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, see how it all loops around. It's all intertwined. <laughs> so beautiful. It's like someone yeah. edited it to be this way. Uh, yeah, almost like a, a, a really good developmental editor helped us with this. So. Um, Obviously, an editor has to be blunt. An editor has yeah. to really shine a spotlight on the mm -hmm. on the on the ugly moles and the warts <laughs> and all the things that need to be right. addressed. Mm -hmm. When you're working with a friend, with someone that you care mm -hmm. about, you know personally, not just as a, mm -hmm. a, a, a colleague friend that you like and admire. How do you approach that? I mean, is is there a way that editors can approach with honesty? and authenticity but without <laughs> really yeah. hurting their souls without destroying them utterly yeah <laughs> yeah so mm -hmm. i what i like to do is kind of like i guess you would say it's kind of like earning your right to criticize mm -hmm. and by that i mean i have i feel like i have to prove to my clients to my authors that i get the book so i'll write like a couple of pages like this is what i see here Mm -hmm. This is these are all the things that are working really beautifully. And I get super specific. I'm I can't just be blowing general smoke, right? They'll know. So I have to get really specific. And the more I look for good things, the more I find them. Mm -hmm. And my 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 feeling is is that if you are reading an assessment from me and you and I've shown you what's on the page and I have glowing things to say about it, and you want to accept those glowing things that I have to say, you want to believe that that's true. You're, the, 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 the onus is on you to also be that open when it comes to the criticisms, the shortcomings that I find. So my sense is that if I have earned that right to criticize by showing you exactly where the strengths are and being honest enough to be specific, you know, to be really specific and show you exactly where then I think there, I think you've kind of, I think I've, I'm going to use a painting analogy. I think I put the primer on the wall and it, you're ready to take the next coat. You know what I mean? And the thing with friends is, I mean, ultimately, I can say all kinds of really great things and mean them. But at the end of the day, if I don't point out the shortcomings and my friend goes to market with a book that's got, clear shortcomings it's gonna come out <laughs> you know what i mean someone's yeah. gonna tell her so yeah. it better be me and we better have a conversation about it and even if she rejects my even if she rejects my criticism and says well you know i wanted to do something else here it's it's out there you know and maybe maybe something you know, shifts in the next draft and, and all of a sudden it's, you know, that, that problem can be solved, not because they necessarily took my advice, but because they trusted me to find when something wasn't quite right and, and look a little bit deeper at that part of the manuscript. Can I riff off that a little bit, Mark? Yeah, please do. What I love, what I love about working with Adrian and the other editors that I've worked with that have been really, really spectacular is that once, once I'm to the point where I'm submitting my manuscript to an editor, it's no longer about me. It's about the reader, right? So whatever Adrian says about my manuscript or 
or whoever my editor is like i i have to like my main goal is that the reader gets it right like because that's the point because because it's about the reader at that stage not me um while i'm writing it it's about me but after i've passed it on you know to in to the editorial process it's no longer about me it's about the reader and again when you when you select an editor you are you have faith in them and you trust them with your manuscript to deliver the best possible story of yours to your readers and so um i know not all authors um have that headspace or heart space um when they're working but that's that's really what i if i if i find something and i thought it was a darling and adrian's like oh nope let's let's ax this and then you know there is that like oh i thought it was great it's not about me about the reader and if she didn't get it the reader won't get it or i have to tweak or ax it or or whatever and what did i love about it and is that somewhere else in the book right like mm -hmm. yeah and that's why I just I love working in teams and I love working with an yeah with an awesome group of people because you can have these candid conversations again to create the best possible book for the reader's experience for the best possible reader experience. So I want to go back to something I think Sarah you expressed to me when you're working on um, another book in this Hearth Hearthstone series. Yeah. And you were talking about the fact that having worked with Adrian on a couple of books already that you're finding that you're adapting uh, better writing based on her feedback from previous oh. books into the new one as you go. Is that a thing that happens over time? 100%. When I, I don't just like to accept changes, right? Like when you get the track changes back. So when she, Adrian was talking about, she, she writes, you know, a few pages, like this is what I'm hearing the essence of the book is. These are its strengths. These are, you know, some of the gaps or any or anything that I wasn't clear on. So, so that assessment with the the manuscript with track changes, it's like a super intensive university course, <laughs> all in like all in that email that she that she sent back. And I I had to pay for my own university and I went to class because I like to get my the most bang for my buck and I love to learn. So when I get when I receive that feedback, like I really, I really try to learn as much as I can from it and unpack as much as I can from it because writing is one of those art forms that you can work your entire life and on it and still not master it the way you feel like like you've mastered it. That's why I love it. It's so dynamic which means you also never stop learning as an author and as a writer. Like you can just, man, the sky's the limit. There's so many places to go and there's so many things to learn from your editors, from other authors, from reader feedback. Like there's just so much um, input to process. Now this is this is the, the nuances. You, you learn as much as you can and you take what works and you you leave what doesn't so that you, you stay true and authentic in your own writer voice because that's what readers want that's why they're buying your book because they they want your writer voice so that having been said my writer voice got stronger working with adrian um because my confidence got stronger so my writing voice got stronger so yeah i can't yeah i can't wait to see what the rest of this series um has and actually just to for the viewers my process is not linear i actually wrote the first draft of book three before I finished the first draft of book two. So Adrian's already looked at book three. Again, not, not a linear mind. <laughs> so Adrian, when you work with a client that you have worked with before, obviously there's that learning about them period that there's a benefit there, but what about mm -hmm. in the actual writing? Cause you know, it's, these are different characters in a, obviously the same series, but a, a different novel. Yeah. What what's that like uh, transitioning into that other book? Well, I have in my head the characters from the first book are still living in there, and I and Sarah and I had this great conversation. I'm like, five years on, here are the scenes that really stand out to me. I think that kind of information is okay. Really look, I gotta I gotta hear maybe one or two of those scenes. <laughs> there are a few. Prime those. I'm lifters. just gonna use some keywords. <laughs> Scrabble. Nice, yep. Beaver. That's <laughs> all I can say. And if that doesn't entice you to pick up this book, I don't know what will. 
<laughs> well, that, that being said, I got to show the book again. Exactly, exactly. Show that book cover again. So, so while I was reading book three, I had these other characters in my mind, and I I was um, you know thinking about you know the long character arc, and um, there were there were there was one like in the within the first draft of book three, there was one there was one instance where I'm like, okay. The characters started out here in book one, and now they're here in book three, and I'm not, I'm not sensing how that happened. And so I was like, "Oh, book two will do all of this," and she had it all planned out. And I'm like, "Okay, that's what I need to know that you have a plan to kind of um, plausibly bring your character from this position all the way over to this one, you know." So, so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping in mind the long game um, as as much as I'm thinking to myself, "Okay." within these specific pages, this, you know, first draft of book three, is this a satisfying story arc? Like I'm thinking about the whole series, but I'm also thinking about satisfying a reader who's only going to read number three because they didn't, <laughs> they were paying attention, you know, which happens to all of us. Yeah. No judgment. So, so yeah, it's, there, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things to be thinking about when you're working with a series and you're, working within a series that, that's out of order. But of course, there's always going to be the doubling back process and, mm -hmm. and making sure. And, and and that can be, that's just an extra layer of quality control. That's yeah. required. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I, I really appreciate you uh, spending time with me, both of you tonight, to talk about collaborating together, working on, on uh, Sarah's books, as, as well as teasing out Kiss Me in the Rain, which is an absolutely <laughs> phenomenal novel. I know when Sarah gave me a copy of, of the book uh, signed to my mom, because I said, well, my mom really likes romance stories. <laughs> I started to flip through it and I got pulled in. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, this is awesome. I love this. This is amazing. So, she writes great male characters. Yeah. There's no yeah. pandering. There's no like stupid stereotypes. I, I actually thank you. And I've, I've been told that and I chalk it up to years in the field with dudes. There I'm you talking go. about your successful marriage. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty cool. You got a pretty, you got a pretty awesome husband too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so awesome. to wrap up, uh, I'd like to ask both of you for some advice for uh, my listeners are often writers as well. So mm -hmm. Sarah, looking back on you, your history as a writer and the things you've learned over the years, what's something you would love to have gone back to tell younger Sarah uh, about writing about the craft of writing the business of writing to give her some hope i would say the dream is real rocket <laughs> and when you have days where you're like am i crazy for pursuing this yes and crazy is where the magic happens so your dreams are real rock them have fun go awesome. for it <laughs> yeah Thank you. And and Adrian, because a lot of writers uh, do listen to my podcast, et cetera, will be listening mm -hmm. to this. What sort of advice do you have for writers who are looking to find a really good editor? What what are some of the things that can help? I want to say knowing when to look for an editor is really important. Oh, yeah. And I want to say look for an editor once you're on your second or your third draft, not your first draft. Yeah. Your first draft, you want to put in a drawer for at least six months, not think about it and then come back to it, you are gonna find so much that's wrong with it, you're gonna be humiliated, and then you're gonna do all your corrections and that's gonna be amazing. And you're also gonna find veins of things that you didn't even know were in there. And those veins, those are the ones you have to tease out. I've just mixed my metaphors, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's potential there that only you can see. Once you have taken that potential from the first draft and kind of given it full flowering in the second draft, then, then and only then, you look for an editor. That's when you're ready. I would <laughs> add to, it's cool to, it's, it's totally cool to, if you feel like working on multiple projects, right? So that oh, when, you, yeah. when, you, when you set, when you set a manuscript away to get that distance that you're, that you work on another one. And then when it's that manuscript's time to get some distance, then you go back to your other one. 100%. Most of my authors have multiple projects on the go and swap them out. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I have to share some of the comments from from folks. Uh, so Laurie says, oh, this is so awesome. Hi, we Laurie. are seeing a perfect 
partnership. She said. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and Thank Tammy, you. Tammy actually snorted uh, years in the field with dudes. Love you, Sarah, as well. So just you know, well, love you too, Tammy. <laughs> So I'm going to close out with that sort of video trailer uh, that we had for the book. And I want to thank you ladies again so much for spending the time to hang out and share your stories uh, with me. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> thank you. Sarah. Good night, everyone. <laughs> I wanted to reflect uh, not only on, uh, this is something that I continually reminded of, and it's the value, the critical value of the right editor and the right writer working together when when that synergy happens when that compatibility when that bond happens between a writer and an editor true true magic can happen you 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 see it it's obvious in Adrian and Sarah and their relationship their the way they interact with one another and because i have the benefit of having read uh those books uh you see it in in the brilliance of the writing that comes out I've always said that a writer and editor working together is as beautiful as the dance between the writer and the reader when that magic happens, when words collide. Uh, it was part of my original keynote from When Words Collide, <laughs> the very first keynote that I gave. And uh, and that's when uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I met Sarah through When Words Collide. I did know Adrian from a past life when she was a sales rep and I was uh, a, a bookstore manager. But I did meet her, meet up with her again, thanks to When Words Clyde. Had to go all the way out to Calgary for that. But anyway, so that, that, that was a magical thing. But I wanted to talk about something Adrian said about um, the right to criticize by first providing very specific feedback. And this is, this is critical when you're thinking about your early readers or uh, editorial feedback or just feedback in general. Yeah, I know as writers that, you know, it's it's wonderful, it's very loving um, when people say, oh, I, I liked your writing, it was like, I really enjoyed that book. Adrian talks about, you know, not just, you know, blowing smoke up up their wazoo or whatever, she was a lot more polite about saying that blowing smoke with the writer, but actually specifically calling out, this is what I liked and this is why it worked and this is how it worked and this is what was good about it rather than a general vague term that's not very useful just like criticism that's not useful i didn't like it. it was boring or whatever no no this particular thing this dialogue is not compelling because it's not believable or it's dry or this isn't in the character's voice or whatever or this scene is extraneous or you need to add something that explains the relationship a little bit better so that by the time you get to this point the conflict is whatever and these are the kinds of things that a good editor can do and it's not just those things that make you know, that, that help you uh, pick out the bad things, but it's the things that are good so that you can understand as a writer. This works because of this, or this is a good scene, or this is an emotionally tense moment because of that. And that is where you find a valuable editor. That's where you can pull things out as a writer and become a more enriched writer. And again, like I said, that is the magic that can happen when you're working with the right editor. Very specific feedback, whether it's positive or negative, all geared towards making you a better writer. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the inspiring conversation I had with Sarah and Adrian. I hope you enjoyed the post-conversation reflection. Thank you so much for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. If you want to support this podcast, please feel free to leave an honest review on the podcatcher of your choice. That always helps. You can always share this podcast, this episode, with someone that you think would find a value in it. That is a great way to help me spread the word and get more listeners out there in the community. Thank you so much again for listening. Always great to bend your ear in this normally a weekly podcast. This just happens to be one of those extra bonus weeks. <laughs> lucky you if you're enjoying the audio and you know, unlucky you if you're like, oh no, I got to get caught up. Uh, in any case, it's there. Do with it what you will. As always, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thank you again for listening. So until the next episode, coming up very shortly, episode 218, this is Mark wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. 
Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.